The following podcast was recorded at the ANZUS Safety and Quality Conference, July 2014. Rapid Response Teams. John Santa Maria discusses what key performance indicators we should measure. I put on my slides that are coming up. Anyway, I think uh, Imogen's comment about. Um, when people get to the ward, having someone just hold the patient's hand is probably a very important role, and I suspect we should do that. Even in ICU, allocate somebody for that new patient coming in to just go in and out and tell the families who are waiting for an hour or so before someone comes along that things are going all right or not. Okay, task at hand. There are some preliminary comments when I was thinking about this. First one came, if we're going to measure things, then we need to go back to the original hypotheses. And I think the merit study put these down very nicely. We, if, if we had a successful system, there would be a reduction in cardiac arrests, there would be a reduction in hospital mortality, and a reduction in um, unexpected admission to ICU. And these are compelling reasons to continue uh, a MET service, and therefore we should be measuring them. The second one, and we'll talk more about this as time goes by, that we do need um, a database of information collected within each institution, able to be queried for important information, and then uploaded uh, to a data repository similar to the ANZIX APD. The third one actually is more reflection, and why should we measure such activity? I think. If you're going to believe that achieving a benchmark means that your institution is better than someone else, then I think we're deluding ourselves. It's the same if we get to a benchmark of uh, central line related uh, infections and we're at the benchmark, then we're, not, we're probably not doing it right. The answer is there shouldn't be any whatsoever. So it's just giving us an idea of we're on a journey to a zero result, no events happening. So to me, um, what we do collecting information is an opportunity to look at trends and patterns and then implement changes that are going to make our patients better. And I don't want to harp upon this, but a minimum data set has to be at what I call a transaction level. So you collect information about each call. You need some demographic information, the reasons why, if you like, the calling criteria. You need the outcome or the MET syndromes. Um, but importantly, if we do all this, we need to know who's going to collect it and who's going to fund it. Because, you know, useless information in is useless information out. It really needs to be high quality uh, data. So to get to some suggestions, I'll call these ones initially the process indicators. We need to collect data on the number, the duration, the types of calls. These are for many reasons. We might want to justify our existence. We might want to get additional staff and show that we're now doing 3,000 calls a year and we do need two people to help out doing this. Um, we might want to monitor the care within hospitals and I suppose that's the idea of some of these indicators that they might show that care is better in one than another. We might want to put in some measures that will look at new changes. So if these national uh, emergency access targets, these four hour rules, are doing some good or are they doing harm further down the line, we need to have some measures there. So the number of MET calls within the first 24 hours, for instance. We might also be asked by our hospitals be to collect information because they have to submit for the clinical indicators. Um, you know, these are the current ACHS indicators, the number of rapid response or MET calls to adult patients, or it might be those within uh, 24 hours of admission, or down the bottom you might actually have the number of patients who experienced a cardiac arrest. And all of these are referenced uh, to uh, the hospital in, uh, admission rates. But I'll just raise a couple of things. What, what do we call a, a call? 
Um, this is, we, we go to a lot of places to make calls. They're in the inpatient business, uh, inpatient building. We go down the road to the dialysis pub. We go to rehab, mental health. We go to consulting rooms. We go to car parks and we go to fish ponds outside. That's where calls occur. We also include the number of visitors who come to the hospital and never become patients. And we do staff members as well. So should we include all of those in the number of calls we do, or should we just focus on the calls on inpatients? This is what Imogen was saying. We need strict definitions around it. So for what I'm going to show you next, I'm just going to do the 401 calls we did on inpatients in a period of time. The second thing is, if we look at hospital data, what, what are we calling an admission? Well, our hospital has rehabilitation, it's got mental health, it's got palliative care beds as well. And if you call, you know, the campus uh, might be extended as well. So do we reference those 400 calls to everybody or do we reference it to a group of patients who are really going to benefit from it? So let's have a look. During the period of time, the hospital logged 29,193 patients that it submitted to what we call the VAED, the Victorian Admitted Episode Data Set, for which we get funding. And we had 401 calls and our calling rate was 13.7, really low. However, if you look at just the acute patients, we call these Category 4 patients, there were 26,900 and our rate's gone up now to 14.91. But some people exclude all the one-day stayers, all the people going to hemodialysis, patients who are short-stay units, or even people who are having day procedures. Take them out and just do those who stay overnight and we're down 10,400 patients, and our calling rate looks much better. 38 calls per 1,000 admissions. And some places say, well, it's the multi-day patient that you need to be looking at because they're the ones who are going to benefit. And we had 6,722, and our calling rate of 59.65 is now fantastic. So I think the answer is we need really strict definitions around what, are, what calls we're going to include and what patients we're going to reference them to. Does it matter? Well, I suppose it does. Ken mentioned this, and this is even from an article that we published a few years ago, which showed that the more intense the calling rate, the better the outcomes, the less arrests and maybe the less mortality. We didn't use admissions, our study used the number of days that people spent. We actually even referenced it to the number of hours, which was a bit more labour intensive, but it could be done. As soon as you come to hospital, you're at risk. So I would think that maybe referencing it to a number like this might be a little better. Well, what other process um, indicators could we have? The calling rates, whatever they are per 1,000, whatever they are within 24 hours of admission, looking at the NEAT um, uh, category. Calls of patients discharged from ICU less than 72 hours. Not sure what the denominator should be there, but you know that might tell us that we're not so good in discharging our patients. Maybe we've got to look at all procedures and who, who gets a call after an operation or after a gastros gastroscopy or bronchoscopy. And we do need to look at unexpected admissions from the ward to ICU. But again, what's going to be our denominator? Many units have lots of ICU beds or lots of HDU beds. And the triage criteria for coming to ICU may vary quite a lot between them. I think we need information about the calls. I'm not sure we can call this clinical indicators, but we do need to do it. The number of pro uh, proportion calls for things like hypotension, hypoxia, and so forth. We need information about the duration of calls just so we know what our workload is and the number and proportion for the syndromes and maybe the number of calls where advanced therapies are needed, who needed intubation, who needed a central line uh, placed at the time. 
we need out comes about the calls, the calls themselves. And um, in the merit study, there were defined criteria. There were the, the uh, event resolved, the event led to death, there was stable rhythm, further treatment and so forth. The, these have all been studied. But we might also have the percentage of patients who are transferred not just to ICU, but also to other specialty areas like coronary care or imaging or who had to go to theatre or transferred to emergency department. Our patient outcomes, well these again are the cardiac arrests per 1,000 admissions, hospital mortality per 1,000 admissions, but hospital mortality in people who were going to benefit, those without treatment limitation air, um, orders, removing those who only come in for palliative care and unexpected mortality. What about delayed activation? Well, this is, you know, this worries us a lot. It's very hard to get data about this. We don't have electronic medical records with observations included that you could trawl through and see, well, patients were hypotensive for hours before a call was made. And I think the best we're going to be able to do are ward by ward audits. Maybe we need to do this every year. Check on a ward or a couple of wards and really define what the interval was, how many people met criteria that weren't called, and, and what was the duration of instability before a call was made. We need to measure things around end of life care because there's no doubt that a met calls are really a time to clarify treatment status. So we do recall, we do actually monitor those who already have an NFR order made, and we also record all those where there is a new call made. And again, it's very hard, and Imogen mentioned this, when you're actually reporting the numbers, you can be double counting because a patient may, might have had four calls and all of those were where an NFR was present or only one of them was and so forth. So we need some very careful discussion around it. Haven't got a slide, but we were talking a, about this before, but maybe having emergency services and now a skilled group of people with nurses sort of going towards and uh, assessing patients this, there are issues around staff satisfaction, morale boosting, and also retention uh, of staff because they're now involved in these uh, activities at award level. And maybe we can talk about that a little bit later as well. So I think in summary, there are many different indicators that we can collect. They've got to be premised on an understanding that there is assistance with data collection and entry, that there is a minimum data set Elements are well defined and agreed upon. And finally, we're going to need ongoing audit and research of such data to uh, provide the best uh, results. Thank you very much. For more podcasts from Antics, go to antics.com.au.